Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is a wonderful, beautiful Sunday morning today. Beautiful day. We're just so happy to have you all with us here at Power Christian Fellowship Church. I'm Randolph Lampkin. Our pastor is Darren Ray Moss. He is giving his message, teaching, proclaiming what thus says the word of God after this Sunday school lesson today, approximately 1015. And we welcome you all. We encourage all of you to stay faithful to God, to Jesus, because he is a faithful God to us. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Second Sunday in October, October 9th, 2022, the Lord's Day, Resurrection Sunday. Welcome and let's pray. Father, we thank you, O Lord God Almighty, in the name of Jesus, Abba, Heavenly Father, for being so good to us, for you are holy and righteous. And we always know that you are in control of everything. Satan tries to thwart your program all the time, even this morning. But you show us over and over and over again, and even the devil himself. You are the Lord God Almighty, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Jesus said, all power is given me in heaven and in earth. Father, we thank you again for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us coming in our midst today by the power of your Holy Spirit, that he will be our teacher to lift up the name of Jesus. We ask that you will forgive us for all of our sins. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Wash our sins, clean and spotless, whiter than snow. You are great. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, unto me. Father, we just thank you for giving Jesus to be the savior of the world. Salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the finished work that you did on Calvary's cross. When you suffer, you bled, you died, and you were buried. God raised you up from the dead on the third day. You are a live God-man sitting in heaven at the right hand of the throne of God. As our great high priest continually making intercessions for those of, of us who believe and who have received you as our Savior and Lord. You declare, and I am the way, the truth, and the life to all of mankind. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Fill us with your Holy Spirit today, Father. Touch those who are sick, suffering, jail, persecuted, those who are lost, and even saved, backslid. Bring them to that place where they will recognize who you are and come back into the fold those who are not in the fold, that they will be saved and be in your fold. Oh God, we just thank you for so many who need you, suffering, mourning from the death of the loved ones, comfort and keeping all of those, your children, bring us to a place where we will be 100% serious about serving the Lord. Let your Holy Spirit have his way. Take the things of Christ. Show them unto us. Use me as your instrument, your vessel. Proclaim what thus says the word of God. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you all of the praise, the glory, the honor, the blessing, Father. Through Jesus Christ, our only begotten Son, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to the glory of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And we, your children, say it. Amen. 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 Thank God. Again, welcome, people of God, and all of those who are listening who desire to become a child of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you. Let's get into our lesson today. Today, we have a wonderful lesson. All of God's lessons are great. He is so good to all of us. 
He shows us every day just how great he is. And, and today he is showing us how great he is. This lesson here is uh, lesson six, Deuteronomy, it's chapter 32. And our text, or should I, our uh, topic today is Song of Moses. Now, we know that songs are lyrics. A song is composed generally of words. It can be musical. But generally here, we're speaking about lyrics, words that are meant to be sung with our voice but not necessarily with music, but music is always important as well. When we're singing songs to the glory of God. And Moses, again, is the deliverer sent by God to deliver the children of Israel from bondage out of the house, the affliction of Pharaoh in the nation of Egypt. We studied about him on last week in Exodus. We, we see that he was born. Now we see him as a grown man in this lesson today. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter had found Moses. God set it up that way in the Nile River in the bulrushes and a basket. And she, she adopted Moses as her own son, even though she knew he was a Hebrew. And now we are to this point where Moses has been leading the children of Israel for many, many years. He was 40 years old when he had to flee Egypt because he was found out that he killed an Egyptian who was whipping a Hebrew. Pharaoh found it out in his life was a lad in, in the balance. So he fled to the land of Midian. Now we see that he has been leading the children of Israel 40 years, but he is at the end of his leadership. He had done something previously that God now forbade him to enter into the promised land. So this song here is, is a beautiful song. It is a song that has been dictated, given to Moses by God. It is requiem to Moses. A requiem is simply a, a, a song for, it is a, a mass for the dead. It is musical uh, setting with the mass for the dead. It is a funeral lament song with loud wealth. And this is a song that God is given Moses to give Israel. Our lesson focus today is proclaiming God's works, God's you against abandoning your creator and protector. Now, proclaiming is simply to declare, to announce. This is what we do publicly relative to our great God and Savior, even the Lord Jesus Christ. We let everyone know, saints and sinners, who we are and who we belong to. Proclaiming God's work. God's works are the works that accomplishes good. God is always doing good. It was said about Jesus. He went about as he was in his earthly ministry, the Bible said, and he did all things good. Here we see that it is seeing God in action. Each and every one of us can admit that we've seen God in action in our lives, where he's done good to us, where he's even brought chastisement to us when we step out of the way of the loving care and loving arms of, of God. But God is the one who ultimately has his arms always stretched out for us to come back when we go astray. 
guards you against simply means taking preventive measures to protect and defend us. That's how God does. He guards us against. And he wants us not to abandon him. He guards us against abandoning, that is, deserted. Does not want us to desert, desert him or to leave him without intending to return or ever to leave him temporarily and not permanent. He wants neither of these. He wants us to stay faithful to him. Your creator, we know God is our creator. He is the one who brought us into existence and everyone and all things. So we should show him glory. He is also our protector. He is our protector in that he defends us, he shields us. The Israelites, the Hebrews, have a name for God. It is Elohim Shamri. And it means that he is our great protector, our shield, our defense, our rock, our sword, our shield. He is our buckler. He is the one who protects us from injury, evil, oppression, danger, and many more. Our first subtopic today is a proclamation of God's greatness. Now, proclamation is an official announcement made in public. That's what we're supposed to do. Jesus said, if ye deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. God said, there's a song that, that, that I love, and Andre Crops, God rest his soul, uh, penned this song many years ago. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where a Christian should be, to proclaim his name, make it public to whomever, not be ashamed of saints or sinners. Then we see, we know who God is. He is the almighty God, the Father. He is the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ in the triune God here, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Greatness is, is, is unsearchable. David penned this word by the power of the Holy Spirit in Psalm uh, 48, verses 1 and 2. And in verse uh, 1, it speaks about God and, and, and all of his greatness. And David said it this way. He is telling us that God's greatness is infinite. It is no end. It cannot be confined. It is limitless. Great is our great God. Then we see here in the second subtopic, the first subtopic covers Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 through 6. The second subtopic is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 10 through 14, and verse 8. A rebuke of Israel's unfaithfulness. And this is God dealing with his chosen people through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through the 12 sons of Jacob who becomes tribes, through the 12 tribes of Israel who become the nation of Israel, even as we know today. But here we see rebuke is an expression of strong disapproval. It is a reprimand. Israel is the nation. Here, unfaithfulness is what we know as not faithful. It is deceitful. It is untrustworthy. Jeremiah said it this way in Lamentations chapter 3 verses 22 uh, through 23. And specifically in verse 23, verse 22, he was speaking about the mercies and the compassions of God, how they are never failing, never ending. And he said this in verse 23 of Lamentations, verse three, uh, chapter 3, they are new every morning. 
great is thy faithfulness. God's faithfulness is new to us every day, every morning when he wakes us up. Great is thy faithfulness. He, the Bible says God is the faithful and true God. God is not a man that he should lie. Then we see as we continue our lesson key verse today. It's Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 3. And it reads, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Deuteronomy simply means second law. It is an expansion of the first law that was given by God to Moses to give to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. Now they have started the wilderness march. So God expanded this second law, if you will. It's not the same as the first law, but it is adding more depth to it for current situations that the law did not cover in and of itself. For instance, there was uh, a group of people in Israel during that time, and we, we see in Numbers chapter 27, in the case of, of the inheritance of uh, the daughters of Zelophehad. Zelophehad did not have any sons, but he had daughters. And the law did not cover what the inheritance could be for the daughters. So the law of Moses in Deuteronomy expounded on this and gave place for these daughters to inherit their father's possession. Here we see in this lesson, it is one that is so wonderful. Chapter 32, we find Moses, Moses' final song. Here, the song of Moses is a great song. It is actually a magnificent song. Uh, the nation of Israel was to learn this song and all of the fathers and parents were to learn this song and teach it to their children. It was to be as a, their national anthem. Uh, every Israelite was to learn this song. When you read chapter 32, you, you see that there is much in this song about the goodness of God and how he had to deal with his people who were rebellious and disobedient, but still God loved them well and brought them into a place of blessing, even finally, the land of promise. Someone has said, let me write the music of a nation do not care what they write in their laws. Music is very important. We sing music in the church here at Power Christian Fellowship Church. It's very important. We worship God. We lift up the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, there are songs in our society here in the earth realm where it is very awful. It is a sad state of predicament that we are in now with modern music, where it has sunk to a, a level that is really frightening. You hear the music being played sometime when different ones pull up beside you at a traffic light, music blaring blaspheming God, degrading the female, even degrading males, saying awful language in the music that is not any good at all. It's not uplifting, it's downgrading. So we have this music, this song of Moses, uh, first four verses as our introduction. Our lesson starts with verse three, but I will read 
verses one and two of chapter 32 of Deuteronomy. Moses is the writer, but Joshua completed the very end of this book. Here we see in verse one, give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender earth, as the showers upon the grass. Here we find that God is given this word to Moses to give to the nation of Israel. He wants them to keep these words. This is the song of Moses. It is really the song of God that he has given to Moses. But this description is song of Moses. Verse three, because I will publish, that is proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. See, this is what we're supposed to do. How little of our literature today promotes God or anything good to say about him. As a matter of fact, it is rare. Usually his name is taken in vain if it is used at all. God has been bringing me into the midst of people who I'm finding out are unbelievers, believers in other religions, blasphemers of God, men, women, young and old, will curse God in a second and not even give thought to it. We live in a, a terrible world who is not uplifting God, it is degrading God. Then in verse four, he is the rock capital R-O-C-K. His work is perfect for all of his ways are judged. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. This is the song about the rock. The word rock is used four times, or should I say seven times in this song. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the rock. Christ is the chief cornerstone of the church. First Peter 2 and 6. His work is perfect. How we <clears throat> should make this known. This song exalts God. And God needs to be exalted. And this God-hated, Christ-rejected world today. All of us see it. We hear it. Christians should be the one who are praising and exalting God, lifting up the name of Jesus rather than degrading him. Verse 4, verse 5, should I say, and 6. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. Speaking about the children of Israel, how they continue to complain about the goodness of God rather than giving God the glory. Here we see God is saying they are a perverse and crooked generation. Do ye thus requite, that is, repay the Lord? O foolish people and unwise, is not he thy father that hath brought thee? has bought thee, had he not made thee and established thee. See, God is the father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and he is also the father of Israel because of creation. He was the father of all of mankind at the beginning of creation. Adam was a son, but until sin came into the world, the last Adam, even the Lord Jesus Christ had to reclaim what Adam, the first Adam, had lost. And he had to do that with his suffering 
on Calvary's cross, his crucifixion, Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ultimately his ascension back to the Father in heaven where he is now, the God-man sitting at the right hand of, thron of the throne of God, a lie. See, God doesn't mention redemption here. In one sense, God is the father of all of mankind because he created mankind, all of mankind. When God created Adam, Adam was called the son of God. He was truly his son, but Adam said. And after that, all of the offsprings of Adam are called sinners. And we have to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord to be called saints. And that is a high word for God, saints. The Bible says we are children of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he calls us saints of God. We know that we are not in our perfection. Not yet. But one day when Jesus comes back to receive us unto himself, we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And we will have glorified by the sin as Christ. Where sin is no longer. Jesus said, I make all things new. The whole human family is foolish. And this is a picture of all of mankind as a crooked generation, foolish people. We all know we do foolish things. We do dumb things. We do evil things. We do things that are even unspeakable that some would not speak of themselves because of how grotesque the things are. Now we have this wonderful stanza on the goodness of God, verses 7 through 14. I'm going to re read this. Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee the elders, and they will tell thee. You see, God is continuing to exalt himself through Moses. When the Most High, verses 7 and 9, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He's speaking about the, the children of Israel. Chose them as a chosen people through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob who became Israel. Now, Israel is a nation. They are a peculiar people to God, a, a special people. But they are a people who is perverse and crooked. They are foolish. They will not give God the glory and the praise that he deserves. Reminds us of some of us people, how we continually see the blessing of God and the good hand of God upon our life and that we continue to complain, grumble, and mumble rather than to praise and glorify God. We look at what we don't have and grumble and complain about that rather than looking at the goodness of God, how he has blessed us with good things, not giving him praise and glory. This is how mankind is. You see it in the children of Israel. Verse 10, he founded him in a desert land and in the waste hauling wilderness. The waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. The apple of his eye is that pupil that in our eye that, that has showed us the reflection of, 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 of images where we can see. We protect our eyes. We don't even want a, a small gnat to fly in our eye. This is just 
how important our eye, our eye is to, to us, our eyes. And this is how important Israel is to God. He protected them. He, he, he gave them uh, many good things. 40 years in the, the howling wilderness, that great and terrible wilderness that they had to endure, not because God ordained it for them, it was because they chose it. How? In unbelief. God led his people and kept them. Why? They were the apple of his eye. This is a lovely expression. Now we have one of the greatest statements in scripture, verses 11 and 12. We read 10, 11, 12. He found him a desolate man and in the waste piling wilderness. This is beautiful. Read in 10 again. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. That means he is very, very precious Israel is to God. Moses is writing this song that God has given him the lyrics, the words to write. Verse 11 and 12. As an eagle stareth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, speaking of Israel, and there was no strange God with him. In the wilderness, they did not have a strange God. They did not have either God. They saw at the base of Mount Sinai, Sinai, what God would do with them and their strange God. And they had error to fashion idol of the earrings and the gold and the rings that they had that they had brought out of Egypt while Moses was in the mount praying to God 40 days and 40 nights receiving the Ten Commandments, the law, communing with God. They dropped the ball and said Moses has gone and left us. They knew of idolatry in Egypt had Aaron, Moses' big brother, to lead them into fashioning an idol and God pronounced judgment on all of those people. Here we see now that Moses is, is speaking about God, how he protects his People as an eagle will protect her young eaglets. Young eaglets will be born in the nest. The nest is about six feet or so where the mother and the father will live with at least one eaglet, sometimes as many as three. And you can see how it can become very crowded, especially when the, the little eaglets grow to a point where it's time for them to leave the nest. That's how we say about our children. They grow up to a certain point. Grown now, we want you to leave the nest. Come. That man that we taught you to be, to become, to be that young woman, that young lady that we taught you to be. Go and establish your household. Put God first to do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. The, the eagle, the, the female, she wants these little Eagles, eaglets to, to leave nine to 12 weeks, they are grown. But sometimes they still want to hang around the nest. So the mother, father are there. They will push the little eaglet out of the nest to let them spread their wings and try to fly. Sometimes, it works for them, when on other times there will be one who is in trouble and he is falling. And the mother eaglet fly under this young eaglet and catch her on her wings. The wings are 
some kind of wings for these bald eagles. We have them here in America. Their, in, their wings can be eight feet plus, the wingspan. So she can easily catch the little eagles. Here we find this is how God is. He is always there to protect us, to catch us when we fall. But we have to look up. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here we see the mama, father is bringing the little eaglets food feeding them the worms, providing a nice place for them to live during the day, feeding them day and night. But they must leave at some point in time. They don't want to leave because they haven't made. That's how it is with children. But this is another reflection of God, how he takes care of us. He wants us to move about in the glory of God to fly and speak of him, to, to praise and worship him, to glorify God, to lift up the name of Jesus. He does not want us to stay in place, do nothing. This is what we need to do, people. We need to be about doing God's business. He wants us to learn to fly. He wants us to live for him. This is another wonderful description of the goodness of Jehovah. Here in verse, verses 16, as we go, I'll read those 16 through 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hath forgotten God that formed thee. You see, God is reminding Israel that he is the rock. He said, I have created you. And in your waywardness, your perverseness, your foolishness, you have forgotten me. This section, verses 19 through 25, will show us the judgment of God upon his people. See, God is a God who loves us, who loves to bless us with many, many, many good things. Just think about yourself individually from the time that you can remember up until now. Even those who are suffering right now, they can attest to the fact that God has blessed them at some point in their life. And is, he is still blessing many of us today. But we have to recognize it. We see the judgment of God will come upon these people in verses 19 through 25 because of their ungratefulness, their disobedience, their foolishness, their crooked thinking. In verses 19 and 20, we'll read. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, that is, perverse generation, children. In whom, listen to what God says, in whom is no faith. Now, God is the faithful and true God. In this lesson, we see that he is described as the rock. We see that Jesus is the rock. In, in, in Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 16, verse 15, Jesus asks his disciples this question, whom do men say? 
He said, whom, but whom say ye that I am? He was further expert, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? They gave the uh, answer, Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But then he said, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter in, in verse 16 said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That means thou art the Christ. Christ is the Greek word that it has been translated into uh, English. But it, it means Messiah, the anointed one. And as we see, Jesus went on and said in verse 17 in Matthew 16, he said, blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, that is son of John. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Then Jesus goes on to say, and I say unto thee, speaking to Simon Peter, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, see, name was Simon bar Jonah, but he's calling him Peter, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, that is, Hades, Sheol, death, shall not prevail, that is, succeed against it. Now, the question is, who is the rock? The rock is Christ. Listen to what Simon Peter uh, uh, said in 1 Peter 2 and 4. The church is built upon Christ. Simon Peter gave his own explanation and let everyone know because people, people are saying that people is, Peter is the rock. Peter in the Greek rock means little rock, a piece of a little rock. It is a little pebble, if you will. Peter said it this way referring to Christ as a living stone to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men but chosen of God and precious. And Isaiah is the one who, who quoted that. Peter is the one uh, uh, who will, uh, he remembers Isaiah. He said, behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. First Peter 2 and 6. Now the church is built upon Christ. He is the foundation. He is the bedrock, the capital R O C K. Peter is the little rock, small ladder R O C K. And Christ is the stone. He is the one who, at that time, will build his church. The church was still future. I know people say that the church was in the Old Testament. I beg to differ. I disagree. It was not. The church came on the day of Pentecost. It was born on the day of Pentecost. 40 days after Jesus' resurrection from the dead, after walking here on earth for 40 days, showing himself to his disciples, the apostles, and other believers, and even he showed himself to those who were his own. He ascended back to the Father after 40 days after his resurrection. 10 days later, he told us, the disciples, before he ascended, tarry ye one another in Jerusalem until I endue you with power from 
on high. He was telling them that he was going to send another comforter. And that was the spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost, the comforter, who will indwell them, lead and guide them into all truth. And they were waiting in the upper room, 120 of Jesus' disciples, the apostles, they are with them at the day, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came as a mighty, mighty Russian wind, and the people be, began to speak in other tongues. Those other tongues are not jibber jabbering that you hear speak, people speaking about today. They were languages of all of those who had come to Jerusalem to worship at the feast of, of, of unleavened bread and Passover and, and stayed until Pentecost. They spoke different languages, those around the Mediterranean Sea. And the Holy Spirit gave these apostles the languages of these Jews so that they could understand the gospel in their own very language. So this is when the church was born in Acts chapter 2. Jesus said, I will build my church, will, I will, is past, or should I say future tense. I have uh, done, uh, I had built, it's past tense. Church was not into existence. We see now that the church will not be destroyed. He says, but the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell, hell is a, a, a translated in the Greek as Hades. And in Hebrew, the Old Testament, as Sheol. It is the place of the dead, place of the unseen. It is the grave. So that's what Jesus was saying. Upon this rock, he was speaking of himself. He is the rock. I will build my church, but the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Listen to what Paul, the apostle, said as he describes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses one through four. He said, moreover, brethren, I would not ye should be ignorant. He said, don't be ignorant of, of, of this truth that I'm speaking to you now. Moreover, brethren, I would that ye should, that I, moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. They talking about the glory of God, how they passed through the sea, the Red Sea, say, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Speaking about how Moses led the children of Israel through the Red Sea on dry ground, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, that is food. Listen to this. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock, capital R-O-C-K, was Christ. So this rock that is being spoken of here in these verses, is none other than Almighty God, Jehovah, even the Lord, Jesus Christ. God gave this to these people. He wanted them to know that he is the rock of their salvation. He is their strong deliverer. Jesus is the rock. Upon this rock, speaking of himself, I would be of my church in the gates of hell, that is, Hades, Sheol, the dead shall not prevail, that is, succeed against it. 
How is that? Because the Bible tells us that one day, one of these days, the Lord Jesus Christ himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with a great shout. And then that shout will be like the voice of an archangel and like a trumpet because the dead in Christ are to be raised. 1 Thessalonians chapters 4, starting with verse 10, tells us that. For the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Here we see that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Death shall not prevail against the church. If we are believers, in God, through Christ, we have received Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord. If we were to die today, the Bible says we are confident to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The, the body is buried in the grave, but the spirit, the real person who lives forever, is ushered back from whence he or she came, and that's to be with the Lord. Then when Jesus comes back for his church, he's bringing those spirits to unite with new bodies, glorified bodies coming out of the grave. Not the bodies we live in now because we still have sin in these bodies. Sin cannot enter heaven. Remember, Jesus said, I make all things new. This is a wonderful lesson people wanted to touch on that because the apostle Peter rock Peter Jesus said thou art Peter he was saying thou art Petros Petros that means you are a little piece of rock but Jesus is Petra he is the rock capital my brothers and sisters, I encourage each of you, if you have not received Petra, the rock, the capital, R-O-C-K, the Lord Jesus Christ himself as your personal Savior and Lord, please do, because he is coming back again. I know there are many unbelievers who don't believe that. And I, as I had this discussion the other day with some who do not love our Jesus, my Jesus, like I do, my final word with them was, well, we will find out one day if Jesus is the savior of the world or is it someone else? They were in total silence, no comment. And brothers and sisters who are saved, we will see Jesus one day, but the Bible says we will see him face to face. Those who are lost, you have an opportunity to receive Jesus now. And if you were to die one day, see him face to face, to be in heaven eternally with God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, all of the angels of God and God's intelligent creation and all of those who are in his church who have been born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 9 verse 10, 9 and 10. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 says if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that those who are lost, who are listening and hearing your word preach, teach, taught, that they will come to a place to receive Christ as their Savior. And those who are saved will be edified even greater than before. And those who are backslidden will come back into the fold. 
all will receive wonderful blessings from you as you do all the time, every day. We give you all of the praise, the glory, the honor, the blessing, the thanksgiving, Father, through Lord Jesus Christ, thine only begotten Son, and his sweet, holy, righteous, and majestic name, Jesus. We pray, hallelujah, glory to God, and we, the children of God, say amen. 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 Thank God. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, remember the month of October, we're celebrating the Breast Cancer Awareness Month from October 1st to October 31st. Let's pray for our women. Some men are developing, but our women especially. Let's pray for them against this horrible devastated disease in Jesus' name for his sake. God bless you all. Stay tuned. Pastor Darren Ray Moss, 10, 15, will be preaching. Powerful message. God loves you all. We love you here at Power Christian Fellowship Church. God bless you all. See you later.